David Brin is interested in us, in humanity, in a species that has interests, that has consciousness, and can use that consciousness to become, as Carl Sagan put it, star stuff pondering the stars. Or as Brin himself puts it, we aren't a curse upon the world. We are her eyes, her brain, testes, ovaries, her ambition and her heart, her voice. So sing. While his biography cites real world concerns regarding ecology, national defense, astronomy, space exploration, SETI, nanotech, futurism, and philanthropy. Each of his novels, too, address some aspect of humanity and its possibility, whether divine or demonic. For example, his Uplift War hexology imagines a humanity whose consciousness, as well as its significance, overleaps the walls of its somatic, earthbound existence. Here, he imagines a humanity who uplifts other species to sentience. But like Lovecraft and Herbert, Clark or Sturgeon or Butler, Brim doesn't just imagine the rise of sentience on a single planet. Rather, he posits a galactic sentience made up of uplifted and uplifting races from many worlds. If humans are the Earth's neural net, it's homo gestalt. The many potential extraterrestrial races suggested by, say, the Drake equation are the galaxy's super gestalt, neural nodes in a vast mindscape woven into the fabric of space-time itself. Ultimately, Brin's universe is Whitman's universe. Everything from dolphins to chimps to hive-minded aliens to us is the journey work of the stars. In fact, in his novel Earth, what begins as a global catastrophe novel ends with humans becoming effectively gods. After stopping the black hole from consuming the planet, one character says the whole and all the mass we poured into it now exists in its own pocket universe. That universe will never share any overlap or contact with our own. It will be a cosmos unto itself, now and forever. Here, Brim may as well have written forever and ever. Amen. Futurist in fiction, futurist in fact, David Brin is one of our most important thinkers, one of our great fabulists. In a recent blog, he writes about our tedious obsession with dystopia that allows so many writers to be plot lazy. It also spreads a poison, undermining our confidence that dystopia can be avoided through hard work, goodwill, and innovation. Like Bradbury before him, Brin denies the dystopian through line. Yes, Bradbury wrote Fahrenheit 451. Yes, it's dystopian. But remember that the end of Fahrenheit doesn't come when the bombs fall. The world of Fahrenheit continues in the Martian Chronicles. Like Brin, like Faulkner, Bradbury too refuses to accept the end of man, the last ding-dong of doom, the last worthless rock hanging tideless in that last red and dying evening. The Martian Chronicles chronicle not the end of humanity, but a new beginning on a new world. Brin's books and Brin's philosophies champion the same hope, the hope that the star stuff we call consciousness can do more than simply ponder the stars. Please join me in welcoming our speaker for the evening, David Brin. I'd like to thank uh, the wonderful 
hosts who have uh, given me such a hospitality. Professor John McCormick, uh, your provost, uh, Mike Austin, and a brilliant author uh, of important works. Uh, Brian Dietrich, of course, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I enjoyed having lunch with Professor uh, Cheryl Golden. Are you out here, Cheryl? Um, and I, meeting so many of your wonderful students, and I see some of them in the front row here. And during lunch, uh, I was mentioning to Cheryl that um, I, I do a lot of uh, punditry, television punditry for TV shows, uh, helps to promote books, you know, history channels, um, life after people, for example. It was very popular some years back. Um, and one of them recently I, I discovered, but I decided to go ahead and do it anyway because they were paying me. Uh, ancient astronauts. Well, I, I, I gave them things in the can that expressed my belief that they're not ancient astronauts. They, they, they did not exist, which surprises some people given the fact that I believe there are beings out there and some of them travel the stars. But the ancient astronauts motif is based upon something that I consider to be very boring. And that's the notion that aliens would travel hundreds, thousands of light years to just happen to arrive when our ancestors were inventing civilization and just happen to meddle with us just enough to make us pile stones on each other or drag sticks through the sand. Uh, to which my response is, thanks a lot. You open one small community college and teach us the germ theories of the disease and movable type and give us glass lenses and we'll take care of the rest. We didn't even get that. But thinking about this notion, why people would want to believe that our ancestors were so incompetent that they could not pile stones on each other or ship statues on each Easter Island, or figure out where the, the solstice and the, and the equinox are so they can put stones in the earth to mark them year after year. And, and, and I consider that to be depressing, because the poignancy of the situation that our ancestors found themselves in is, in my opinion, more moving than anything I can think of. Picture them thousands of years ago. Unlike the animals who live embedded in time, we routinely extract ourselves outside of time. We contemplate time. We know we're going to die, or we fabulate reasons to believe that we won't. We tell stories and expect those stories to continue after we tell them or after we're even gone. And so being able to step outside themselves and look at their lives, our ancestors, who were powerful in nature, once they had stone tools, a hundred word vocabulary and fire, they were the masters of this planet. And they proved it by killing the predators on their herds. And as a result, our goat herds spread, our population increased, the goat herds got larger, and they ate everything in sight and deforested large sections of the Middle East and, and the Near East and Asia. We were already transforming the earth and destroying large parts of it before we even had agriculture. And then we get agriculture, and we discover that we were even more powerful. We could build spaceships, huts, shepherd's huts, to replace the caves, or towns, mud brick towns, that would, with the lamps, turn night into day. And change the courses of rivers so that they would irrigate our fields and cause a fecundity of surplus wealth that would enable some to specialize in 
and become scribes and begin the long path of civilization. Little knowing that unless you do irrigation right, you poison the land with salts and you turn it into desert. And this explains why, funny thing, what used to be the Fertile Crescent is now that desert that we fought over in Iraq. To be aware of time, to be aware that you are the most powerful thing on earth and you can't stop your child from dying. You can't stop the plague that tears apart your, your village. You can't stop the mysterious bump on your abdomen that's going to kill you. And you can't get the answers for what the lights in the sky are, what the meaning of it all is. We reached out to stories in order to give ourselves a sense that perhaps we might get power that way. And the ancestors who built the pyramids thought that doing so would increase their already significant power to the level where they could master death. On Easter Island, they chopped down every single tree and lived in chaos afterwards, an impoverished land where the topsoil blew away and all they had was terror root chickens and each other. And they could not even use the resources of the sea because all the trees were gone, they couldn't make boats. And under those circumstances, somehow they got it in their heads that shipping stone figures and dragging them to the coast and setting them up would somehow, in a magical way, give them the power to regain control over their lives. And in so doing, the question was not, could they then chip stone or pile stones on each other? How insulting to think that they couldn't do that. Human beings, once they get it in their heads that something is important to accomplish, they do it. Whatever is within their power. And for thousands of years, we got it in our heads that incantatory things, because that's what we have the most power over, words. In the Bible, Words create the universe. And I was just talking about at lunch, about how if you studied physics, you get to see the equations that God spoke when he said that there be right. And I have seen a few things more beautiful. A rainbow, perhaps, certainly my children. But to stand outside of time and to realize that you are the most powerful thing anyone has seen, and you have no power. We created oral traditions in order to pass things forward. Oral traditions that we know from the Achaean era of the Greeks, their oral traditions passed through a fellow named Homer and got written down in the classical Greek period. <laughs> Pardon me. And writing became the magic of your life. And you were looking at one of the great magicians, because what could be more powerful than the world building of not just science fiction, but other authors, because they create characters and other beings, but above all, they create chains of black squiggles. In my latest novel, Existence, there are about one million black squiggles on pressed vegetable matter. Or these newfangled, glowing things you whippersnappers have. They cast out, still cast out, the same black squiggles, and you use the same techniques that we have managed to fool entire civilizations into spending billions to train every young person to be able to, chain, to scan chains of black squiggles so quickly that the incantation takes effect in their fertile minds. 
And instead of seeing black squiggles anymore, some of you have done this. You're scanning a book, and you forget the black squiggles, and instead, you experience star-spanning explosions in deep human insights. Kissy, kissy, love, love. Adventure, romance. And what are you doing? You're unrolling an incantation that then does what magic does. And the only verified thing that magic has ever done is to create subjective realities in other people's heads. Now, in my industry, and it's industrial grade magic, because I can get a million people at it, not at the moment, but a million people to scan these things and unroll the incantations. Wow. And each of them, the effect is different. Whereas science is repeatable. Technology is repeatable. But you, you have industrial grade magic in that case. Now, how do you think they felt, our ancestors, when they first saw somebody write a cuneiform message, and it went to a far corner of the kingdom, and somebody looked at it, and the voice of the king would pour forth. The words of the king would pour forth. They thought they were getting it. They thought they had the magic under control. I'm much better at it than they are, than they were. And <laughs> I know better. I don't control the cosmos. Only the universes of exploration that I create in fiction. And to show you how I feel about that, I am easily as proud of my scientific work as I am of that. But it's good, it's good to create incantations that create sus willing suspension of disbelief and vivid subjective realities in your hands. These traditions got passed down. And we find, keep finding very interesting things about the past that indicate that some of the oral traditions weren't entirely made up. We knew, for instance, from Schliemann a century ago that Troy <coughs> existed. How amazing. And it was the basis for the Homeric traditions. We are finding more and more about the flooding of the Black Sea Valley that occurred about 10,000 years ago. That was so traumatic, and we can now sonar find villages that were flooded and others that were evacuated as the Mediterranean poured into the Black Sea just 10,000 years ago, less than that. Such a major event must have carried down through time because all of the tribes and nations of that region had stories of great, great floods. But all tribes, human tribes that we know of, had a tradition of something else, and that is the notion of a golden age in the past. When people were better, they flew through the sky, they were close to the god or the gods. And we fell from that higher state to our present benighted level. And you can see the psychological reason for that, because grandparents were always complaining that the grass was greener when they were kids, that things were better when they were kids. And you took Gramps' word for it. It's a natural extrapolation to have a golden age in the past. The amazing thing that is that any civilization ever came along that changed the location of the Golden Age. And you students, a few of these things will sound familiar to you because I've spoken of a few of these things earlier in the day. But to transform the position of the Golden Age from the past to the future is something that only occurred in a few human cultures very rare because it is hubristic 
It is an act of hubris to say, our children may be better than us, and by implication, we're better than our parents. I found that when I was giving a talk about science fiction in China back in 2007, somebody stood up and said, yes, yes, we're enthralled by science fiction. And by the way, there's a great science fiction novel from China coming out next year, by far the best science fiction ever to come out of Asia, called The Three-Body Problem. Yes, yes, things can get better, but it frightens us to make optimistic views of the future, because that implies we're better than our ancestors and that insults our ancestors. And I said, look, I understand your reverence of your ancestors. What I don't understand is where you think it's an insult to, tell, to say that you're better than your ancestors. I don't get that. Isn't that what they would have wanted? Isn't that what you want for your children? And it's interesting because they didn't think of the answer to the first one, but the answer to the latter was yes. They wanted their children to be better than them. But to extrapolate that around and say, I'll bet my parents wanted me to be better than them. So isn't it an insult to say I'm not? Because it means they failed. It's interesting. I happen to, you know, I have three kids in college at the same time. Despite all the suffering they put me through, I have to tell you, I think their generation is just better than us boomers. There's about a dozen ways in which they're better. And I consider that to be bragging. We made you. But the point is, that turning around and putting the golden age in the future frightens many people in our culture. Because hubris is something to be feared. Because it might insult the ancestors. Or someone more powerful than the ancestors. And the notion, the brash notion, that we are moving forward is a difficult one. And really, only one civilization ever embraced it. And it is part of our current civil war. Deep underlying our political issues is over this question of whether the path forward is one that we should invest our energy. Earlier, I spoke to the students about the organ that makes this possible. Two little nubs above the eyes that are called the prefrontal lobes. They're the most recent thing we ever evolved. It's very clear uh, from a great deal of evidence that they're only 150, 250,000 years old. Not only from archaeological, from uh, paleontological and genetic evidence, but also from the fact that they are the last organ of the human body ever to kick in. And we find that the fetus, for example, has gills and a tail. It's called recapitulation of evolution. Some babies are even born with little scars of the gills, or with the little scar uh, where the tail had just been recently resorbed. The recapitulation continues after birth. The baby can close the epiglottis against the soft palate and do what other mammals can do, but we can't and that's breathe and drink at the same time. We can't because uh, about age one and a half, the larynx drops three vertebrae, and you can no longer close the epiglottis. And so babies at age 18 months very often go through choking episodes because they, they get excited and they try to breathe and drink at the same time or even speak. Again. It's recapitulated. The last thing we do is the prefrontal lobes kick in around the age of university students, 19, 20, 21, even 25 for some males. And it makes a serious difference in the way they think. How many of you have ever had kids who went off to college and at the end of the sophomore year, they came back 
and said, gosh, Dad, it's amazing how you've grown this last year. Come on, it's a classic. Even Mark Twain said it. These are the lamps on our brow. The Bible calls them the lamps on Moses' brow. Oh, they don't call, they call the priests on the loaves, but they say that Moses had, the Bible says that Moses had lamps on his brow. And for a long time, that confused the hell out of people because they couldn't figure out what it meant. And so they thought there was a mistranslation. The word horns is very similar to lamps in Hebrew, so they thought, all right, he had horns. And so all depictions of Moses throughout the Middle Ages, including the greatest sculpture Michelangelo ever produced, probably one of the greatest ever produced by anybody, the statue of Moses in, um, in, in Rome, has horns on its head because of this mistranslation. We now know what, at least metaphorically, it meant. And that is that he could outwit the Pharaoh because he thought about what was going to happen next. And these are the organs we use when we, uh, when we say, you know, uh, what might happen if I present this plan at the faculty meeting? What might happen if people see me wear this tonight? What might happen, as I said, if I try to run this yellow light? They're the organs that light up if we think about our consequences of our action. When we extrapolate ourselves into a possible future, and they also light up when we try to extrapolate ourselves into the shoes of other people to imagine what must it be like to be that person over there? What might she be thinking? What might he be about to do? And you can see that that is a power that is even more useful with enemies than it is with friends. Isn't it one of the most powerful things a general wants? To be able to put himself in the shoes of his enemy? That's why empathy is actually a trait that we do see to some degree in tigers and stalking animals. But not our kind of empathy. Not a sense that we are that other person to and you enhance this with the ability to understand their languages, which we did not have in the past. With television, which was in my generation, the way by which we started to empathize with people in other lands. Or with the written word, like Pearl Buck's, um, you know, famous book. What was it again? The Good Earth, that's right. At least watch the movie. Where before television movies and before that books spread our ability to empathize elsewhere. And it's no accident that after what I've called the concave century, I had an article that ran in, in uh, I forget, but you can find it online. It was basically the 14th year that pointed out that the last three centuries, as far as the theme of that century, began on the 14th year. A hundred years ago, last month, when, what started? World War I. And brought to a complete crash all the notions that had been prevalent then. That the Ed age of Edison would result in unalloyed growth, and unstoppable progress. And we plunged into what I call the concave century, which reached its nadir in 1943. And then the good people of the earth, the people who had the courage and the technological prowess, the guts and the civilization, <coughs> to drag us out of that pit. And it took some real dragging, including finding a way to isolate, hold still, and contain communism without triggering a war that would have killed us all. And Steven Pinker of Harvard University got in trouble from all ends of the political axis a couple years ago for his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, 
which solidly shows the statistical proof that every decade since 1943, per capita, worldwide, per capita, violence has plummeted every decade since then. And poverty has plummeted every decade since then. And yet, both the right and the left in America refuse to let us be aware of this good news for entirely different reasons, but they are collaborating in this charade. What will be the theme of the 21st century, since Bryn predicts that the 14th year is when it begins? It's not just 1914. 1814 was the end of the French century, the fall of Napoleon. 1714 was the end of the War of Spanish Succession and the beginning of the French century. Am I a numerology freak who actually believes any of this? Of course not. I'm a scientist. But it am also a science fiction author, which means I will use metaphors to shake you up. And you will think about this. The question of whether or not we can step back and be aware of the arc of what we're doing is, in my opinion, one of the most important of our times. We were trying this magic of words, telling stories by the campfire. You know, it, it is, as an author, I must tell you that it's a completely different experience writing a novel than it is writing a short story. They are very different in their style and substance. And actually, the short story was safeguarded in the English language by science fiction. For most of my life, the, far, the vast majority of professionally published and paid for short fiction in the English language was published in the science fiction poems. Some of the wonderful stuff, Ray Bradbury's stories, most of his works were not novels, but, 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 uh, but short stories. Um, Robert Sheckley. Shelley. Fantastic thought experiments, but a different kind of thought experiment than the novel. There's um, there, there are experiments going on now with completely different forms. For instance, the 250 word short story it has to be exactly 250 words, or the 100 word short story. Or Wired Magazine held a contest a couple of years ago for a six word short stories. Based upon um, Hemingway's famous short, six word story, uh, For Sale, Baby Shoes, Never Worn. Now that's poignant, but it hasn't got much of a plot. <laughs> Only one scene, no action. No conversation. I figured I could do better, and I won the contest for with Wired magazine. There were some really good ones there, but most of them were like the Hemingway one, where they it set a scene. I'm going to give you one that has three separate scenes: dialogue, action, violence, poignant tragedy. Six words. You ready? <clears throat> I've actually memorized it. <clears throat> Vacuum collision. Orbits diverge. Farewell, love. Three scenes. It's set in space. The point is that stories help to consolidate societies all through time. The origin legends and so on would help a society to hold together. They were terribly important. They also provide context within, against which people measure their lives. Stories can encourage opportunities. They can warn. 
One of the most powerful forms of science fiction is the self-preventing prophecy. We spoke about that this afternoon, didn't we? And that is the story or novel or movie that so prevents, that so well presents a failure mode for our future that millions of people come away determined to help prevent it from ever happening. What's the granddaddy of all self-preventing prophecies? Obviously, George Orwell's 1984. Some might say the Book of Revelation, but we'll see about that. Uh, Soylent Green has a movie that it recruited millions of environmentalists. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, uh, Dr. Strangelove, On the Beach. Stories that helped to prevent the failure mode of nuclear war. Not all science fiction aspires to that level, nor achieves it. I don't think I have any self preventing prophecies. Though Ray Bradbury certainly had one called Fahrenheit 451 that girded millions to defend literacy if the time ever came when it was under threat. Far more often you have warnings that are more conversation with the reader. And then you have the play of simplistic cliché dystopias that fill our cinema. Alas, not self-preventing prophecies, but rather tedious repetitions of the same trope over and over and over again. Either the villain has red glowing eyes and for some reason wants to, wants to kill everybody, or all the teen dystopias we see today simply are summarized as, I am a star-shaped peg that you, you are trying to make conform into a square hole. Society is impressing me by trying to make it, make me live up to your expectations. When has there ever been a teenage angst? <laughs> more, more common than that one. Despite the fact that this is a civilization that encourages eccentricity more than any other. And it is the teenager's infliction of conformity upon each other that's the real. Isn't it? That's the real tyranny. I often point out, and people are very surprised, that we are subjected to propaganda. Actually, no one's surprised. Everybody believes that the people at the other end of the political spectrum are subject to, to propaganda and swallowing. Whereas I, and my side, we all examine the evidence and draw correct conclusions. Alas, we are in phase eight of the American Civil War right now. And that is a sad thing. And I hope in Kansas you will remember which side you were originally on. But that's a separate matter. <laughs> the point is, the point is that we are subject to propaganda, but it's not what most of us think. When I ask this question, people say, say buy stuff. Yes, that propaganda is definitely there. Conform. There are many others that people raise their hands, but almost nowhere. And have I seen somebody mention the five most common propaganda messages in most of the movies that you've enjoyed over your lifespan? Suspicion of authority. You don't bond with the character unless that character is either abused by or defies an authority figure. Tolerance, diversity, individuality, and its cousin, eccentricity. Because in many, many films, the, your sympathy with the character is engendered in the first five minutes by showing some eccentric trait. Now, is, are these the propaganda messages that fill the old legends or the legends in many cultures? Not really. 
Which raises the question, why would the secret masters of our civilization ensure that all of our movies spread paranoia against secret masters? <laughs> Are you sure about this, Bryn? But it's there. It's right there. The obvious hypothesis is that we're voting for this with our ticket sales. That it's what is reinforced by our already existing values. A hundred year, 120 years ago, Frederick Jackson Turner published a book that deeply disturbed Americans. It was called The Closing of the American Frontier. No, not The Closing of the American Mind. Some one of you out there knows what I'm talking about. I you can know. <laughs> the closing of the American frontier frightened people in Teddy Roosevelt's era. Because the frontier had always been there. All right, there were already people on the frontier. They were living there. A large fraction of them had died from smallpox. But Alexis de Tocqueville, 60 years earlier, had spoken about how the existence of a frontier changed the American personality because there was always some place you could go to reinvent yourself. Most of the escaped slaves did not escape north, they escaped west. The notion of being able to reinvent yourself was a powerful influence on us, and it was one of the biggest reasons why the British fought hard in the war because the Scots-Irish they were sending over in the Revolution, the Scots-Irish they were sending over were just leaving their indentured servitudes and fleeing to the hills, where they interbred with the Cherokee. <laughs> and people were afraid, and Frederick Jackson Turner said, what's going to happen when the frontier is finished? Will this mean that we will turn back into being silly people like the Europeans who are in pyramidal social structures, obsequious to inherited oligarchy and authority. Well, he said that that was the likely thing, but he had that giving him credit. He suggested there was another possibility, that the habits that we had learned from 300 years of the frontier were so anchored in our mythology that we would simply find other frontiers. 10 years after he wrote that, Americans were flying through the sky. Reinventing ourselves is part of the mythology that I was just describing. It's implicit in those five messages. Now, how we interpret those messages is part of the problem. If we were able to talk to each other, we would realize that a decent conservative is worried, of, suspicious of authority, but the conservative is worried most about Big Brother coming from, you remember a, a couple of you, from uh, snooty academics and faceless government bureaucrats. The decent liberal is concerned about Big Brother coming from aristocratic lords and oligarchs and faceless corporations, to which the answer is one of the most beautiful sounds, communicative and expressive sounds, that my generation came up with. Do any of you remember what it was? Duh! This is why this inability to negotiate with each other and the destruction of American politics and our turning into camps in a reignited civil war is so tragic. Because actually, if you put it the way I just put it, a, a liberal can understand why a conservative would be concerned about bureaucrats. Uh, it's less likely than oligarchs who ruined capitalism and freedom in 99% of human cultures and pyramidal social structures, but, but yeah. And a conservative should be able to say, uh, I like people getting 
rich, but I see your point about inherited wealth. That's what we should be arguing. How the kind of, the, the kind of argument we should be doing now is constructive arguments when we see each other's point. Whose interest is it to have stoked us into a position where we assume that anybody to the left of our favorite cable news show or anybody to the right of anything it, it is crazy. Whose interest is it that this should have happened? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Those five messages, which have a basic wholesomeness to it, can be warped, as we've seen, if you only turn your head, if you have fused, political fused spine disease, and what we need in this country is political chiropractic, be able to turn your head. But there are a couple of messages you also see in films that aren't wholesome at all. One, our neighbors are all sheep. How many films have you seen like that? Because, and the second one is, no institution can be ever be trusted. No institution will ever function. Now, mind you, I said self-preventing prophecies. It's one thing if you come up with a movie in which this institution has gone corrupt, this institution has gone evil, this institution is to be criticized as corrupt. That's criticism. Criticism is the only known antidote to error. Cetokate. Criticism is the only known antidote to error. And it's why, despite all the other reasons, the best and biggest reason to get married is because you get all the criticism you need. <laughs> At least that's what my wife tells me. <laughs> no, 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 it's totally true. It's totally true. <laughs> the great human gift and the greatest human uh, greatest human um, failing is delusion. And if you become a leader who's capable of repressing criticism, you will. And I've just explained human history. Whereas we've created a civilization based upon reciprocal accountability. And this is, I'm finally tied up in one of my books. This is the basis for the Transparent Society, my nonfiction book, that won the American Library Association's Freedom of Speech Award. It was one of the only public policy books from the 20th century. It's still in print there. It's the happy. Um, but the notion that our neighbors are sheep and no institution can function is based upon laziness. The film directors would get pissed off if they were ever in trouble and dial 911 and skilled professionals didn't rush to their aid. But do they ever depict that happening in a movie? Because if they did, the movie would be over. Your individualist would, <laughs> would be helped by skilled professionals who his taxes pay for who would say, that's really good what you did in scene one, sir. We'd like to debrief you now, and we'll take it from here. Where's the fun in that? That's no fun at all. So you can see why they do it. And yet, I liked the Spider-Man films. Spider-Man movies, not very good art. But Spider-Man spends 90% of the movie saving New Yorkers, but there's always a scene in which New Yorkers save Spider-Man. Have you noticed that? It's kind of cool. And it violates that cliche. And it's the cliches, to some extent, that are killing us. It's the belief that our neighbors are stupid. How can we maintain an enlightenment civilization under those conditions? The whole premise of our civilization is the positive sum game. The notion that there are ways of setting up our games that are not zero sum. And you need this concept. Zero sum means I only win by making you lose. 
positive sum means that in the marketplace, I may get more market share than you this year. But you're going to come back with a better product next year, and the fight never ends, and we all get better products as a result. It's supposed to happen in democracy with policies. It's a, it's, it still happens in science. That one's healthy. It had better be. Justice courts are also competitive arenas that are supposed to produce the product of justice. It works if we let it, but it only works in regulated markets where cheating is minimized and where we are able to trust each other to some degree and hold each other accountable. Prediction is what we do with these prefrontal lobes. Einstein called it the Gedanken experiment, or thought experiment. Half of relativity theory was him imagining himself on a streetcar, leaving the clock tower in Bern, Switzerland, at the speed of light. And just imagining the rays of light and how that would affect his perception and the rest, the other 50% of relativity theory, the math, he sort of partly left that to his wife. The thought experiment is the what if. And we have to become better at it because we're charging into the future. In my latest novel, Existence, I talk about how the trend that we see in this phase of our civil war is partly not at all about left and right. It's about fear of homeless. Remember we talked about that? Fear that if we arrogate what used to be considered God's powers, that we'll be punished for it. And this was the theme in every single Michael Crichton story. We should not act as apprentices, and pick up the tools of creation. But Einstein said that he was amazed that the laboratory door was left unlocked. The blueprints were on the table, the reactor, the, all the chemicals, all the tools of creation are right there to be experimented with. I'm here in a center of modern theology. And I asked at lunch today, what prayer set a creator of this vast, fabulous cosmos would prefer? Here's one. Oh, you're so big. Oh, you're so strong. Please don't squish me. Here's another one, a 15-year-old. Some of you remember I mentioned this earlier. A 15-year-old chemistry student who the night before calculated out a titration, mixing chemicals the next day, and then she, she, she sees that it comes right out, and she says, oh, oh that's neat. Why, thank you very much. I, I, I was very proud of that when I came up with it. Not so you know this. Which prayer do you think such a creator would enjoy more? Well, I don't know, but I've certainly put my thumb on the scales by the way I told the story as to which creator I would respect. Unlike some of my peers, I am not an atheist. But I take a collegial attitude, which would be considered heuristic in most past cultures. The first thing I would ask if I found myself in an afterlife is, are you ready for a bunch of questions? It's an attitude. But it's an attitude 
that we have seen you for in the Tower of Babel. And unlike the Mormons or the Muslims, who reinterpreted that one-page story and say explicitly that God was angry, the Bible does not say God is angry. It does not. It's simple cause and effect. This is a guy who a page earlier drowned the world and a page later is pouring fire and brimstone on people's heads. And what does he say? He says, if they continue like this, nothing will be beyond them. Therefore, let's scatter them and make them diverse. Send them off to be a diversity of cultures. To me, the lesson of that was not yet, but you're capable of it. You were made capable of it. Anything, anything. Wow. So we have these prefrontal lobes, and they have us do the Gedanken experiment. They send us thinking about possible future golden age. And we worry about the minefields and the quicksand pits and the punji sticks and the, all the things into which we could tumble as we run forward into the future. And you think I don't worry about that? I'm an expert on SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. I'm going to be debating this issue at the American Advancement of the American Association for the Advancement of Science general meeting in February in San Jose. I've tabulated about a hundred possible explanations for why we haven't met extraterrestrials. And among them are some scary ones. And some are getting wiped off because we now, 15 years ago, we knew of no planets outside our solar system. Now we know of at least 2,000. So we know planets are so that one gets checked off. And you were a member of a civilization that did that. That did that. That has found 2,000 other worlds out there with a spacecraft that was made as an afterthought. The replacement for Kepler is going to find, they estimate, 150,000. Do you remember the part of Genesis where God asks Adam to name the beasts? It's the purest moment in the Bible. The utter purest moment of a relationship between the Creator and the Creator that has nothing to do with sin, redemption, any of that stuff. It's just curiosity. The purest moment. And most of theology just brushed it aside, just like the Tower of Babel. It's cute. But it's probably one of the most significant moments in the entire world. And here we are, a people who can inexpensively make a space probe that discovers 2,000 worlds, about to discover 150,000. A year and a half ago, my children were in in our living room, and I was interpreting NASA speak because I'm on some NASA commissions and I'm an innovator in the Advanced Project. Projects Commission chooses seed grants for advanced technologies. And I was interpreting the NASA speak. Well, that means the arrow shell was successful. Oh boy, the arrow shell just dropped off, and I was interpreting it. And and I was bouncing up and down. Because after seven minutes, we had sent an, a space probe so accurately that it could break in the thin Martian atmosphere more accurately than if you were to shoot a bullet from here through a window in Paris. The arrow shell busted off. Out popped a parachute that lowered the space probe still too fast, so the parachute dropped away, and a rockets, rockets, set of six rockets went off, slowing it down to a standstill, and then the rocket lowered down by crane 
a bat, minivan-sized laboratory that is still doing science about Mars in your name, <clears throat> naming beasts, naming this crater, naming that rock, naming this phase, this epoch of past Martian history. And if you think he doesn't like that, then why does she interfere at any of those phases? I went to the window at that point. How many of you remember the movie Network? Come on, Peter Finch. Getting everybody to stand up and go to the window and yell, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Come on, raise your hands if you remember it. OK. The rest of you watch the movie. It's an important movie, and it shows the true acceleration of the boomer generation's addiction with sanctimony and self-righteous rage, which was really valuable for a while, because we had a lot of things to repair. A lot of age-old bad habits that the parents and their parents and their parents had of racism, sexism, and so on. The sanctimony was useful. But it's killing us now. And I went to the window, and I opened it, and I screamed. I'm as proud as hell. I'm a member of a civilization that can do stuff like this. And if you didn't do that 18 months ago, shame on you. It means you're not paying attention to what your $2.50 of taxes did that day. So are we a curse upon the world? That's a mantra of the left. A mantra of the right is the world doesn't matter because it's all good and anyway. Bullet me. We are at the essence. And that's the explanation. So we can talk about those things um, and some of my novels or any of the other topics, but I think I've blathered it long enough. I was a scientist, I was an engineer, I was supposed to try to be right, and I was right about comets. We have a space probe, no, the Europeans have a space probe, and a comet right now, it's about to make a lander, and it's proving my doctoral dissertation down the line, no, oh, I don't. Here I just insulted them, I'm so sorry. But. In those professions, in some of your professions, you have to be right. All I have to be is interesting. So let's open things up. For, do we have any time for questions? Yes, we do. All right. There you go. Oh, got a drink. Any questions or questions? Complaints? I just turned Paul McCartney age. No, not the same age as he is, but you remember the song, Will You Still Need Me? Will You Still Need Me? <sighs> okay, here's the question. Yeah. I want to follow up on your recent comment about uh, animals and uh, the idea of lifting them up. And I, I'm not really connecting the, uh, the issue about animal rights with what I thought you were talking about in terms of raising the species to a higher level. Well, if animals have total rights not to be meddled with, then you can't do the experiments and you can't change them. But a lot of the arguments against uplift are species. One is, if you'll excuse the word species, but one is that they have their own dignity. They have their own types of intelligence. Well, that's fine. I totally agree. If you were transforming the species from one thing to another, that would be a case. But you would leave the fallow species alone. You would increase their habitats. That's what we should do. We should be increasing the habitats, making things easier on natural dolphins, for example. But that's totally separate from taking 50 or 60 of them and creating a new subspecies. That's simply giving some of their descendants a different destiny. What might be convincing to me is the pain. There would inevitably be pain, no matter how well we did it and how carefully we did it. I 
I'm not the first science fiction author to broach this idea. Pierre Boulet's Planet of the Apes is based upon that. H.G. Uh, Wells is uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau. Uh, Corbinator Smith's series of the future, and it's in all of those cases the simple Crytonian failure mode of us being cruel. Uh, Mary Shelley's failure mode for Frankenstein. Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein's failure mode was not creating life, it was being a bad dad. He, he, you know, he treated the monster terribly. The monster came out good and was taught to be a bad person. My departure on this is to posit, what if it were done by us? Guilt-ridden, open, transparent, eager to do it right, and not aiming to make slaves, but partners in our civilization. Wouldn't there still be interesting problems? And so that's what I portray. But the notion is based upon something that's come out in science very recently. That it's not just dolphins and chimps and gorillas who have borderline intellectual capabilities. Turns out in the last 15, 20 years, we found borderline linguistic ability and tool use in prairie dogs, sea lions, parrots, corvids, crows, elephants. And the lesson suddenly becomes something different. How easy it apparently is that nature and Darwin allow so many of them to crowd up at roughly the same level, the glass ceiling, that nobody else, maybe, maybe velociraptors were at the same level. But they didn't have a space program, so the asteroid came. <laughs> and maybe what we did, crashing through that glass ceiling, not by a little bit, but by bunches, was a fluke. And that may be an explanation for the Fermi paradox, why we don't encounter humans. In which case, the universe needs us which is a scary thought. Anybody else? By the way, there is a sub-branch of Christians that are in conversation right now. They're kind of cowed right now. But they believe that Jesus' words are more important than John of Patmos' words. And Jesus said, spread the word. And how can you obey without going to the stars? Which means an open-ended and scientific civilization rather than one that ends in, um, shall we say, an extremely unpre unpleasant slit. Anybody else? Yeah. I was going to ask you, before you mentioned the Fermi paradox, about what your your favorite explanation might be why uh, extraterrestrial intelligence hasn't shown itself. I am bothered by the number of very smart fellows, Stephen Hawking, Mitchell Cocker, so many others, who have taken the Fermi Paradox and they leap to say, this is the explanation. That's so terribly unscientific, especially in a field of research in which there is no subject matter. I, I consider it my task to catalog. And I do rank them in order. I, I consider there to be about a dozen that are better than other explanations because they are powerful and consistent with modern science. I believe that it is possible that the numbers are really, really low of the fraction that break through that glass ceiling to full level sapiens. I think that's, in my opinion, number one, but it's not, I believe, that much of a fluke to fully explain the paradox. However, you add some others, like the fact that 99% of human cultures were shaped like a diamond, like a pyramid. And these were conservative cultures in which 
a burgeoning of science was viewed with suspicion because it would empower the middle class. It would empower young people questioning authority. And it would empower people to go to frontiers that would take them out of your authority. And it may very well be that this kind of Darwin re rewarded pyramid, because it's rewarded. This is why we have these, pyramid, these pyramidal shaped social structures, is that the lords who managed to get it on top had harems. They got everything. It's in our genes. We're descended from those guys. But what if it really took root in a large fraction of the civilizations out there? They'd never get to the stars. And if our civilization fails, our diamond-shaped, middle-class, rambunctious civilization that believes you have to prove your, yourself every generation instead of automatically inheriting the status of your parents, and so many other weird enlightenment traits, that are being warred upon now by those who want us to be in phase eight of the American Civil War. Because they want a return of their little social structure. If you, if this enlightenment experiment fails, it goes back, the powers that be will fight much harder than Plato and the other aristocrats in the Hellenistic era fought to discredit Pericles and the Athenian democracy. And believe me, they fought very hard to discredit it for 2,000 years. It could be that it would never come back. And in my novel existence, I portray meetings in the 2040s of an oligarchy that's trying to figure out how to restore a pyramidal social structure without some of the flaws. So Earth and Existence are my two novels that are the most you know, intellectually challenging. They're set in the near future. The Postman is the one I recommend the most for those who want to uh, have a good read to take to the beach. Uh, I guarantee that one. I'll pay your money back. And then Star Tide Rising and Uplift War are the ones that are about this uplift concept also trilogy that starts with Brightness Reef. The, um, one of my funnest is Killing People, that's K-I-L-N. That's um, a future in which you can make copies of yourself every day in your home and kill. Brief Monday copies. Wouldn't that be convenient if you get everything done? Do we have any other questions? If you feel you have to go to the bathroom, just get up. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I'm just curious. I, I like your approach to kind of knocking down the dystopian theme. Uh, but I'm curious. You, you talked about 1914, right? And <clears throat> European culture congratulating itself right before this cataclysm. And I'm just curious. Couldn't a critic say to you, uh, in many ways, you could be the equivalent of a German scholar in 1912, talking about how we've come so far and the future is promising, yeah, absolutely. and the next thing we need. But, but if the theme of the 21st century is just a continuation of the 20th century's dour you know, refusal to accept that we've climbed our way out, well then what the hell happens to my theme? It's just more of the same. No, if, if my metaphor would come true, then it would have to be something different in the 20th century. And given my age, it doesn't surprise you that uh, I happen to believe that it's the dawning of the age of Aquarius, the age of Aquarius. But on the other hand, give me a head of hair. <laughs> How the heck should I know? It's my job to put out plausibilities. You know, I, I, my, some of my fans have kept a, created a wiki. This young lady here had it happen. Uh, created a wiki tracking my predictions. And without a doubt, it's above average. Uh, especially in predictions from that one novel, Earth. A lot of stuff had come 
true. Well, you know, what the heck. If you look at page 206 of the Transparent Society, there's a real Twilight Zone moment. <laughs> Where I talk about, suppose as a thought experiment, someday something terrible happens, like, for example, terrorists bring down both World Trade Center towers. This book was written in 1997. That's weird. Sometimes I even scare myself. Yeah. I was wondering, do, um, a lot of science fiction authors depict extraterrestrial life, and we do find it as more sophisticated than ours. Why do you think of that? Because of time. If civilizations last a million years, or 100,000 years. Well, ours is new. As a functioning, technological, self-critical, diamond-shaped civilization, it's 200 years old. As a literate civilization that's able to concept, con uh, conceive the concept of extraterrestrial life, it's 500 years old. As a, as, as, as a civilization that's able to grasp time it's just six or seven thousand years old. Well, you know, what's likely? What's likely is we're going to run into aliens that have been around longer than us, simply by the rolling of the dice of time. I mean, we certainly would like to have descendants a hundred thousand years from now. And we would like to think they are more sophisticated. In my um, nonfiction book, Star Wars on Trial, I contrast Star Wars universe, in which no institutions can function, your neighbors are sheep, and the only people who matter are demigods. Your standard trope, going back to Achilles, the Vedas, Murasaki, standard comic book stuff as well. Demigods are the only ones that matter. This is a very old tradition. Same thing in most fantasy novels and fantasy stories. Only the demigods and the lords matter. Science fiction is part of, is a cousin of this tradition, but an offshoot. Because in real science fiction, it's people and civilization that are really interesting. And the metaphor for this is the metaphor of the ship. The ship in Star Wars is a World War I fighter plane, silk scarf and all. The heroic demigod with, or knight, with his Sancho Panza squire or gunner or, or droid. And there's no room aboard a snub fighter next week for civilization. Star Trek is a naval vessel based upon the Beagle. And the whole notion of the naval vessel is that the captain is merely a whole lot above average, not a demigod. As a matter of fact, in Star Trek, when they encounter a demigod, they go, uh, huh, what's your story? Treating the demigod with some skepticism and judging him or her by their behavior. This is not what, the way people treat Darth Vader or Luke Skywalker. But above all, the captain needs collaboration from skilled, above-average crewmen all the time. And the Enterprise is large enough that it carries the Federation with it. As a matter of fact, half the episodes, the topic is civilization. Flaws in the Federation, perhaps. Failure modes, perhaps, to criticize. Great. Or the good things that we're doing thought experiments now about how we ought to behave when we get out there. To be using the prefrontal lobes to be thinking in advance about how we ought to behave when we have titanic power and meet other civilizations so that we won't behave like we are shown behaving in Avatar or the way our ancestors did when they had titanic power and sailed up to other civilizations. And the sad thing about that Avatar, a wonderful film. But it's based upon the premise that nobody in that world ever watched Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> or any similar movies. 
any of the self-flagellatory, you know, we better behave better or we'll be just as bad as Cortez. Anyway, so much for that. I hope I answered your question. Any, uh, yeah? Is uh, one 64-year-old to another. Aha! Uh -huh. Then you remember the music. Yes, indeed. We may not be as nice people as these kids. <laughs> we may not be as smart. Yeah, funny thing but is, uh, purely from an accident of history, boy, every single freaking week there was something good. And we were so spoiled. Indeed. Let me tell you something, you whippersnappers. <laughs> Any week of 1968 would have killed you. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Any week of that year. But you know what it was like as if Pandora's box had been opened and everything was flying all over the place. But what was the last news item of that year? Can anybody tell me? The last thing on all the newspapers, the last thing covered by the television. The circle of Exactly. The power of it. Which was the first time humans had gone beyond Earth the orbit. And they brought back what? Not neurons. They brought back the two great works of art of the 20th century, both of which were created by the nerves, not ours. The image of the floating blue oasis in the desert of space. Because visual art, if you accept my definition, is that which upon looking upon without, changes human hearts without persuasion. And that changed us. And it was like the diadem of hope at the bottom of the chest after Pandora opened at the end of that year. Amazing. But there was another image created by nerds that changed us even more. And I'll give you a clue. It's the reason I'm standing here. Because my generation was scheduled to all die on some far off World War III battlefield. Instead, we got the other. What stopped that from happening? It changed us. And I mentioned the movie, Dr. Strangelove. You should know now. The Mushroom. The image of death made real. Saint Mom saved us. Now that's irony for you. Who would have thought in the debates between a genuine genius saint like Robert Oppenheimer and a mad Hungarian, Edward Teller? Teller would turn out to be right. Oppie said, you believe that if we have equal balance of terror, that we will use these things? When has that ever happened before? And Teller said, never, but it will happen now. And that's why you and you and you and you are here. And maybe it was a gift. Um, in 10 years, suppose that you were going to predict what will happen to the world of higher education that we will all be surprised about. Well, already this last year, there has been a just fantastic takeoff of online courses. And the effects will mostly be overseas because the world will gain access to a massive of education. And there are bright kids in the third world who are getting almost all their education this way already, Khan Academy and so on. And these uh, new, you know, Lumosity and some of these other, some of these, uh, no, not, not Lumosity, uh, Udacity and so on, are
are, are coming out with these new systems. But it's not going to change the fundamental, and that is that um, 90 of the best, of the 100 best universities on the planet are in, are in America. And that's not going to change, because it's a matter of attitude. And it's also a matter of just fundamental design of the undergraduate baccalaureate degree. We were discussing this at noon today. The, um, the American baccalaureate degree is different than most of the world. Most of the world copied the, Brit and the European bachelor's degree. And it consists of three years of total specialization. A 19-year-old goes to university and specializes from the word go. And to each of us, this is horrific. This is an appalling. The Jeffersonian approach is that you go in your first year, you don't even have to make up your mind. Although it's ideal if you want to keep all your doors open, you keep taking science and math. But if you become a science or math major, you have to take a whole year's worth of humanities and English and history. And if you're a humanities or English or history major, you have to take a year of science and math. And the result being lots of nerds and geeks who've taken enough history, English, and math to know that it's pretty easy and that they could take it and get an MBA or a law degree if they wanted to or start a company. <laughs> We've seen the results. And an awful lot of humanities majors who know at least a little science. You think that that's not, not important? Last year, the year before, and the year before, the United States of America ranked number one worldwide in adult science literacy. <clears throat> that is such a strange thought that you probably are having trouble wrapping your head around. But the words adult science literacy, remember those prefrontal lobes? These international tests of memorized knowledge that we flagellate ourselves over are testing high schoolers. They don't have them yet. <laughs> and we don't emphasize memorization. But when you test average citizens, United States citizenry scores 18% in adult science literacy. And this should cause your pen to split, big with both pride and shame. I'd like to reserve one last short question to myself. Since you're a futurist, I want to know, is this the year for Kansas City to win it all? <laughs> This whole um, how politically how political correctness moves along, um, you know, I, you have to weigh things and balance things. I'm totally behind the left on the Redskins. I will probably back them when it comes to the Indians. Chiefs and Braves are another matter. Those are professions. If you can have the Oilers and you can have the Brewers, you know. There's an argument there. An old brain is a profession. You can have teams named after professions. <laughs> but you better start making those arguments now so that you can get the compromise. Because if you just wait, I mean, it, if, if moderate conservatives had gone to moderate liberals and said, we will back gay marriage as long as you agree not to call it marriage. They could have gotten that. You could call it garage. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it would have been a compromise, and this thing would have been over. A lot of steamed people at both ends. But that's the problem. We're not negotiating with each other. The moderates are negotiating with each other. And of course, the gay people would have said, right, garage, five years. Then, then it's off. But to be able to use jujitsu 
Little compromises, temporary things. Dance around. Negotiate. Turn your head. Political chiropractic. And with that, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to sign some books. And you've been a lovely audience. And let's move to the future.